Welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. We're also on YouTube. YouTube. You'll find the links in the podcast description. I'm also a podcasting coach because I've got five podcasts and four of them are in the top half percent. You'll find everything on bio.link forward slash podcaster. I'm looking forward to this conversation today because I always enjoy talking to fellow podcasters, but also he's a blogger. He's, he's an author and he's living an in, a very interesting life. Please welcome Dan Clauser. Thanks, Roy. Thanks for having me on the show. Looking forward to the conversation. So, I mean, my strategy here is, I'm not sure you're one, but the way I do it is I always like the guests to introduce themselves. So you might let the listeners know, who's Dan? Yeah, absolutely. So Dan Clauser is a person who spent 30 years in the nonprofit sector, working in a uh, youth nonprofit sports organization. And in August of 2020, decided to open a new chapter of my life. And my wife and I sold all of our stuff, our house, everything we owned for the most part. And we bought an RV and we're now traveling around the United States, uh, doing a lot of volunteer work, um, podcasting, blogging, as you said. And I've uh, authored three books so far, um, working on uh, my fourth and fifth books at the same time here. So, uh, you know, do some speaking engagements in our travels and, Again, just really looking forward to this conversation with Roy. So I suppose let's, because of the podcasting is very interesting to me because, you know, I, I've helped a few get started as well as on my own. And I think, is it 121 episodes that you've got? It's uh, the journey of, of my mother's son is, is the name of your podcast. Yeah. Yes. Yep. 121 episodes so far. Um, and uh, really we're, we're not traveling right now. We're kind of in a little bit of a pause for about another month here back in our hometown of Pennsylvania, in, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, so I've really been able to, you know, dig deep into, um, you know, reaching out and getting some more interesting guests um, on the podcast and um, really looking to get, you know, booked out into advance, um, you know, for when we start moving again, because once we're, once we're moving it on the road, I got to be a little bit more strategic as to when I'm, you know, scheduling shows and um, scheduling to be on shows and that sort of stuff. So um, taking advantage of the, the little pause that we have in our travels right now to, you know, really kind of, kind of stock up. I mean, like I've got three interviews today, either conducting or as a guest. Um, and that's not really something that I can do a whole lot um, when we're on the move. So, um, you know, the podcasting part, you just got to be strategic in how you're, how you're scheduling your, your time and your interviews for sure. No, yeah. Well, what I do because I have equal custody of my son, I I tend to try to do as much on Tuesdays and Thursdays when he's not staying with me in them evenings and blot it out. But I know that if you're driving around, you can't just say, "Sorry, darling," but I I I've got a call in half an hour. One, you don't know will you have a you know internet, and two, will you be able to park somewhere? So you really have to plan plan it out properly. Yeah, we do. We do. But it's fun. It keeps it keeps it interesting. And and the whole concept behind my podcast, you know, it's called The Journey of My Mother's Son because a lot of a lot of the inspiration behind us getting rid, rid of everything and selling really came from my mom when when uh, she was in her mid 40s uh in the, back in the 1980s, she decided to uh quit a good paying job and she took an old 1967 Plymouth Valiant and took the back seat out of it and put a mattress in there and, and traveled around the United States just uh doing a lot of volunteer work and visiting with friends and family and just you know living life on her terms. So um when she had passed away, you know, we went through a lot of her journals and just saw some of the stories that she had told about, you know, people she met and that sort of thing. And that was really the the impetus behind wanting to to podcast and, you know, help tell our story in real time through blogging and, um, you know, podcasting with, you know, a lot of pet podcasts I do are actually in person in our travels as well um, of just people that we'll meet in a campground or people that we're volunteering with on a project and, you know, being able to tell their stories because I think everyone has a story and I think they can all be incredibly inspiring. So that's really the concept behind um, why I wanted to continue podcasting. I'd, I'd done podcasting for our organization, um, but really my involvement in the podcast was was just conducting the interview. I had no idea how the background worked, how it got into the interweb, you know, none of that stuff. I just sat down in a studio, did an interview, left, and, you know, a week later, I got a link to, <laughs> to go out and, and share it. So, 
Um, but it was something I really enjoyed was sitting down and having conversations with people and learning about them and, and allowing them a platform to tell their story. So when we decided that we were going to start traveling, um, that was something I wanted to do. So I went to my producer at the time and another friend of mine who does a, a podcast and, you know, they kind of showed me the, the back end of how things work. And, and, uh, you know, now I'm doing everything from the, the interview to the editing, to the, you know, uploads and producing and all that fun stuff and, and really enjoy it. I think it's a great platform um, and a way to, again, just give people who wouldn't normally have a voice, a voice to tell their story. So, so kudos to you for having, having five different shows that that's like, I, I couldn't even imagine juggling that. I know what it's like with, with one show and granted I've got the RV element element and the traveling element, but and I don't know how you do five shows. So, so kudos to whatever you're doing in the background there for sure. Right. Yeah. And I, I edit them all myself as well. So I know the, the amount of work, but the reason that I edit them myself is uh, I make the show notes based on that. And a lot of the time then from just whatever notes I'm making, I take the title then. Whereas if I outsource it, they they wouldn't, no matter who, it's going to be very hard to get that. Like, Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I saw Lipson is who you host with. Have you always been with them or did you change? And because I'm I'm looking at all the different ones and I like to get the kind of pros and cons for each just to help other people as well. Because there's a lot of podcasters that listen as well. Yeah, Libsyn's been the only platform I've used. And um, so I can't really compare it to anything else. Um, I, I like it. Uh, their, their customer service is good. If I run into an issue, um, you know, the support gets back to you pretty quickly. Um, so I've really had no no issues with it. Uh, and like I said, my my old podcast, I don't even know what platform my producer was using. I know it wasn't Lipson, um, but, you know, even when I first started this podcast, probably the first eight to 10 episodes uh, were still being produced by the, the producer of my show that I did with the organization, which was called Stepping Up to the Plate with Big Vision Foundation. And uh, so even them taking uh, those first existing shows and transferring them to the Libsyn platform was super easy in, in my opinion. Um, so I've been very happy with them. Um, and, but again, I've got nothing to compare it with. So, yeah, but, yeah, but even but, just, just to know that they've got good customer support, because to be honest with you, not all of them do sometimes like I've got one with Podbean. They're fantastic. They come back immediately. Anchor mm, a bit, a bit slower. You know, they used to be good, but when Spotify bought them, no, it's a, a lot slower to actually get it. You know? So that's why, you know, I'm contemplating moving one or two of them from anchor. Yeah. Yes. I'm happy with them so far. So you're doing the blogging. How long have you been doing the blogging and have you found that it's helped with your audience as well to fire your podcast and other stuff that you're doing the speaking as well? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've writing has been part of my life since I was young. Um, I mean, when I, uh, when I was like 10, 11, 12 years old, I, I used to hand write a little news newsletter um, for my brother's adult soccer team. He's nine years older than me. So um, we'd lived in Florida at the time. He was playing in this adult soccer league. And I wrote this just on notebook paper, you know, front and back, a little newsletter that I would, you know, hand out to the players and their wives and girlfriends before each game. And then they'd read it. And it just really was something that I was enamored with. I, I loved, you know, seeing reactions of people reading what I wrote. And, you know, at 10 or 11 years old, it probably wasn't all that good. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I still got some really good reactions. I mean, I guess, you know, on a sliding scale, maybe it was pretty good for a 10 or 11 year old. Um, but I don't know how it looked today. Um, so writing has always been something that, that I've enjoyed. I mean, even, uh, with my organization, we would publish a newsletter and I did a lot of the writing in the newsletter. Um, I published my first book in, in 2012. Uh, I republished it with 10 new chapters. It came out um, last July, July of 2021. And then my third book, um, which is The Journey of My Mother's Son, volume one, same name as the podcast came out just this past May. Um, so I really enjoy writing and I, I understand um, the way it can speak to someone's heart, um, 
and you just kind of throw it out there. So kind of a long answer to your question. Yes, I found that the podcasting and the blogging, that it's all kind of intertwined, um, you know, to, to create, you know, what we're doing on this, on this journey. Um, so yeah, they, they definitely, they definitely feed off of, off of each other where, you know, I'll get some people say, Oh, I listened to this podcast and then I, you know, I went back and I read this one blog and vice versa. So it definitely, you know, it definitely feeds off of, off of one another for sure. And just with the, the books then, cause I'm, you know, a lot of the guests uh, are authors and I'm curious about self-publish or a publisher, just curious what way you've done it, because I see a lot of the publishers tend to shaft the authors. Yes. Um, so I self-published, I use the publisher, I'm back to self-publishing at this point. Um, and I think a lot of that, you know, I, I, I love music as well. I, I'm not a, not a musician. Uh, I play harmonica a little bit. Um, but that's something I've noticed as well, where you talk to a lot of independent music artists and they're like, you know what, I don't want a label because, you know, a label is going to try to, like, I'm an artist and I want to put my work out there without someone else trying to polish it up um, strictly to monetize it, you know, like I'm an artist. And I think, you know, as a writer, it's the same way. It's a form of art. And uh, I had some issues with, with my most recent publisher as far as getting royalty payments on time and some stuff like that. And I, I just came to the conclusion that, you know what, at the end of the day, this is, you know, this is my property. This is my intellectual property. Um, I want to control it. I want to dictate how it goes out. I want to be able to track the sales. Um, so I've, I've gone to self-publishing and back to self-publishing. And honestly, if I get approached by a publisher, I'm not sure that I would, that I would, you know, go. I, I kind of like the, the, the freedom of, uh, you know, of self-publishing at this point. And the, the reality is like you're doing all the promotion. So a lot of people think, oh, I've signed with a publisher. They're going to do all the marketing and they're going to be in thousands of bookstores and I'm going to get a fortune. Like most of the people I talk to, between 50 cents and a dollar per book, and they expect you to do the marketing. So if you're self-publishing and you're on different people's podcasts or doing your own, you're making maybe five bucks more. I mean, I know you can print books for a dollar if you go to the high numbers like so you can make a lot more which in turn because there's a lot of work i mean i've written books myself and there's a lot of work to it you know it's not something that you just do overnight like you know i know some people say yeah you can do it in seven days or 30 days but the reality is when you want to do a decent book it takes a lot longer yeah 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 and it's definitely it's true the the publisher's not really doing a whole lot of marketing and even some of these big name um you know, books that once they're published and, you know, they hit the New York Times bestseller not list overnight almost, the, the publisher is not really doing anything. It's generally because they've got an author who's already got millions of people on their platform and following. So, you know, the minute that person publishes a memoir, um, people are flocking to the, you know, to the store to get it. And the publisher really did very little marketing and in even a situation like that. So, you know, when you really weigh everything, um, you know, the, the sales are dependent on me, you know, and obviously, it, you know, that goes hand in hand as well with, you know, speaking engagements obviously help increase sales and, and stuff like that. But you're literally, you know, when you self publish, I mean, you're, you're literally selling one book at a time, you know, with, you know, every podcast you appear on, you're kind of marketing the book to an extent. Um, you know, everything you, you do in social media, you're kind of marketing it to an extent. Um, so it really is grassroots um, way of, of going out and, you know, gathering those sales. So I've had loads of different speakers on my show, but never a person that, I don't know, would you call it like a nomad? I call it yes saying because, you know, it's more positive, but like the reality is you're based as an RV. How, how have you kind of found to, I suppose, get on stage and just do you, do you kind of work out a schedule and go to them different resort areas or how does it work? Yeah. So, um, you know, we'll, if there's enough, um, you know, demand, we'll, we'll schedule our travels around where, 
you know, where the speaking comes up. So, you know, we're, we're never booked um, that far in advance ourselves that I can't, you know, it's not like generally people are booking you for, you know, to come speak two weeks out, you know, you, you generally have some time to, um, to make that adjustment. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's the nice thing. It's like, look, you don't need to worry about airfare for me or anything like that. Just tell me where I need to go. And, you know, we'll drive there. Just make sure you got enough parking in the, the parking lot for a 33 foot RV and, and, you know, we're good to go. So, um, it gives the flexibility and, uh, I, I love actually referring to it as the nomadic life. I don't, you know, I don't have any issues with that as well at, at all, because that that's really what it is. And it's an incredible lifestyle. You can, you know, one, one day you can have, you know, mountaintop property and the next day you can have beachfront property, you know, and, uh, it's, an, it's incredibly, uh, liberating and, and freeing for sure. So absolutely love the lifestyle and it, you know, it allows me to do things that we've never been able to do before. And I mean, I, I want to delve a bit into your speaking thing, but I think, because there's a lot of people that actually like that lifestyle and there's a, from my what I'm witnessing there's a lot more turning to kind of you know living in RVs or mobile homes and stuff like that you know traveling around it's what's the pros and cons because obviously you said you're two years into it now and it's great that your partner is involved and I know I read about your dog as well that you you know or I've listened to one of your shows you've overcome it but like what's the pros and cons of it like you know the people that might be contemplating doing it the, uh, you know, the, the pros are, again, it's very freeing, very liberating. Um, it's less expensive, even with the way fuel has skyrocketed, it's still less expensive than living in a, a regular house. Uh, there's no property taxes. Um, granted, you have upkeep on a, on an RV, but it's still not the same type of upkeep that you have, um, in a regular house. Um, you know, the other pros are just the community. The RV community is an incredibly um, wonderful community. I mean, salt of the earth people, um, giving, caring, um, engaging. Uh, I, you know, like I'm, I'm truly an introvert at heart, um, but I've found uh, I've become much more extroverted once I've become part of this, you know, this RV community because it's it's just a different lifestyle and um, you know, there's not a whole lot of small talk, um, you know, people aren't, you know, there's no agenda involved. Um, nobody's looking to get anything out of you. Um, it's just, you know, true friendship and, and interaction. Um, you know, the cons are obviously we're not around our family as, as much as what we, you know, had been when we lived in our regular house, but, um, when we really reflect on it, I, I'm not even sure that that's a true statement because even though we, you know, we may have lived, you know, 10, 15, 30 minutes away from our family before, it's not like we spent every day with them. Um, so now it's just, we're a little bit further away, but we still, when we get back together, I, I think the time that we do spend with them is much more intentional than it ever was in the past. Um, so honestly, cons, I can't, I can't come up with a whole lot of cons to the, to the lifestyle. I mean, it is just an amazing um, lifestyle. I mean, obviously the price of gas recently is probably a little bit of a con, you know, that wasn't something, you know, that was ne necessarily a budgetary item when we first started, it, it kind of went through the, the roof a little bit, but you know, we've adjusted to that and it, you know, it'll come back down. It's just one of those ebbs and flows. So um, I, I'm really, hard pressed to think of what the cons of, of the lifestyle are. So anybody that's out there thinking about it, um, I, I encourage you to do it because it's, again, it's a wonderful community. Uh, it's incredibly freeing. And, and this, you know, this country that, that, you know, I live in here is just so beautiful. And, you know, if you take the time to see it and appreciate it, I just think you get a greater appreciation for life. And, uh, again, just going back to the people we've met, I, I think um, you're going to find that there's a lot more good in the world and a lot more good people in the world um, when you're out there traveling and meeting people that you otherwise would probably not strike up a conversation with. So, um, you know, that that's the other thing I think that we've really discovered is that 
you know, I, you know, I'll be the first one to agree that our, our world is a bit of a mess in general, but if you're looking for good people, you're going to find them and, and you'll definitely find them on the road. No, I totally agree because I mean, I just spent uh, a month in Tallinn with my son and there was, I don't know, something like 1500 people. It was Mind Valley University, people from all over the world. And the reality is that everybody, there's so much beauty there. Yet, if you're sitting down at home watching the news, all you hear is doom and gloom. You're listening on the radio every hour for some reason. We've been bombarded. You hear negativity, negativity. And then you just assume that's the reality. And the reality is there's a, there's millions of people out there doing amazing things and they're there to help you. Yep, absolutely. Agree with that 100%. 100. And that's that's the other pro is that we don't watch the news that much when we're in an RV. <laughs> exactly. You know, I, I mean, you're at nature, you've got a dog, so you know you can't get much better than that, really. I mean, you you if you go to a beach or a mountain, you don't want to stay in the RV, you want to get out there and take a walk on the beach or talk, get, walk up the mountain, which is better for your health as well. Like in, yeah. Absolutely. That you know, we've had people say, like, how you know, how have you how did you adjust living to in such a small space? You know, because we went from a 3,500 square foot house to a you know, slightly less than 300 square foot RV. And I'm like, I mean, it's not like when we're at, at a spot, we're not just sitting in the RV, we're we're get we're outside, we're we're enjoying nature, we're on a trail, we're at a beach, um, you know, we're hiking up a mountain or something like that. So, um, the, the adjustment. It's very easy because you're not, you know, the, the goal of living in an RV is not to sit and spend 24 seven in the RV. It's to get out in nature, you know, use the RV to transport you there and, and to sleep and cook. You know? Absolutely. So with, with your speaking then, because I know you set up a nonprofit and you were doing that for 30 years. So obviously you would have done some speaking with that. I know you're speaking engagement because I've got listeners that are obviously seasoned pros that are sharpening the saw and then there's others that are afraid to get out. What I'd like to know is your journey from what you've learned, you know, because a lot of the time as we develop, we start picking up a few tricks and going, oh, if you could kind of take a little journey on your speaking, what, what you've kind of learned that could help others. Yeah. So, you know, again, I was kind of forced into a speaking role through the nonprofit because, you know, being the leader of the nonprofit, you know, I spoke a lot. I spoke to small groups. I spoke to large groups. I spoke at our, at our banquets and stuff like that. And initially I was scared to death, um, to get in front of people and speak. Um, you know, at our banquet, there was a time where I could not eat the meal um, prior to speaking in fear that I would be, you know, running to the bathroom and puking my guts out before I got up on stage, you know. Um, so it, it's funny. And, and I think for anybody who's out there and they're you know, just starting and, and, you know, trying to adapt and get over that fear, because I think we all have a fear. You know, I think that's very natural. And, you know, the way you overcome it is just to continue to do it, you know, that, and, and even now, like I can eat before I speak now, um, but I still get nervous. You know, you still get nervous no matter what. Um, but I think once you're out there, what's, what's really helped me is, you know, kind of scanning the audience and um, making eye contact with some of the individuals in the audience. And, and I think you can see those that are really getting something out of your message. And I think that's what then, you know, fuels you to continue. Cause you're like, okay, I, I can sense a connection with this person. And then you look over to this side of the room and it's like, oh, I can tell by this person's body language that they're really connecting to what I have to say as well. Um, and for me, that's been the thing that that's really you know, fueled me and helped me um, as I'm, you know, speaking is just, again, you know, scanning the room and, and making contact with, you know, different members of the audience and seeing how um, you're connecting with them while you're, while you're speaking. Um, so again, just, sure. just on that, that's a, like, I, I look at that as a positive mindset, because I remember one time I done an open mic TEDx and the guy before me, he just, he told me, he said, don't concentrate on anyone that's not engaged. Look at the people that are supporting you and that are there. And I did. And I remember there was a guy just sitting there. Like I'd say he was, but if I had put my attention, but I know some speakers, they put their attention on if someone's on their phone 
and they forget about the people that are actually benefiting from it. So when you look around, you go, wow, these guys are really getting it. It's your own positive mindset reinforcing what you're doing, which encourages you to give more to the people that are you know, engaged. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's so true. And that, that is, I, I never actually kind of thought of it that way, but that is so true. Cause you do, you know, there are people who they'll look and, and uh, you know, they'll get caught up in, you know, the one or two people that aren't engaged, the guy that's kind of dozing off or on his, <laughs> on his phone or, or whatever. But, you know, those are so many times the, you know, the minority, but yet as humans, we get caught up sometimes in that negative minority where like two out of 200 people could potentially not be engaged, but yet those are the two you want to want to go back to. And yeah, that ends up drawing negative, negative energy where if you're you know looking at those that you're engaging with and that you're connecting with, yeah, you're feeding off that positive energy for sure. And like you've done some workshops as well, yeah. When you were, do you still do that, or was that kind of more when you were doing the the nonprofit? It it was it was more um, with the nonprofit, but it's certainly something that you know I'm available and open to do um, for sure. Because I do like those kind of smaller settings because you do get a lot more interaction um, in in those settings. Because you know when we used to do workshops, it was really. Um, you know, they were very interactive and a lot of, you know, give and take, um, you know, they, they were coaching workshops, um, but it was, again, it was all about involving the, you know, the people who were there in the workshop. It wasn't just, you know, a PowerPoint presentation and you standing up there and talking for 45 minutes. It was a lot of back and forth. So I really did enjoy the workshops and it's not really that I haven't uh, I haven't done many since we started traveling, not because I don't want to, just because the opportunities haven't arose. So it's it's definitely something I would be, you know, very open to and and uh, would very much uh, enjoy getting back into doing some more workshops than I'm doing right now. So, and like, you know, obviously you've done uh, now 30 years with the nonprofit. Is there still times that you're doing speaking for kind of profits, nonprofit companies in your two years to recently? Yeah, yeah. Um, we uh, we actually volunteered at a uh, nonprofit uh, faith based drug and alcohol rehabilitation center down in Beaumont, Texas, called the the Dream Center, and I I spoke there a couple times while we um, while we were staying there, and that was very enjoyable. I mean, nonprofits are always going to have a special part in my heart. Um, you know, it's just being part of that world. I mean, being you know someone who started it and built it from scratch. Um, you know, I was 20 years old when I started my organization, and I never would have guessed at that time that it would have, you know, gone on to live for, you know, 30 plus years at that point. Um, so anytime I have an opportunity to, you know, to go and share with a nonprofit, and especially, you know, youth sports organizations are always still going to have a very special, you know, place in my heart, because I understand, you know, the importance of uh, teaching young people life lessons through sports. Um, and unfortunately, that's something that, you know, a lot of youth sports organizations aren't doing nowadays. It's more about just, you know, the wins and the losses and, you know, whatever else happens, happens. Um, so anytime I can, um, you know, spread that message of it's bigger than the game, um, you know, it's, it's really about teaching kids life lessons and understanding that no matter how good they are, at some point, the sport that they're participating in is going to pass them by. And in that case, they're now going to have to figure out how are they going to become productive members of society. So if you're not teaching them that as a coach, you're, you're failing them in the long run. Oh, I always love when a speaker is actually, uh, you know, giving back because, you know, sometimes there's, there's plenty of speakers out there doing different things. But I think, you know, when you've got a skill set to do something that kind of makes the world a better place is, uh, is what's the most important thing. Yeah, definitely. I agree. So you, you have the three books. You might tell people the name of them. What's the other two that you're planning? Is it a continuation of that? Yeah. So the, uh, the three books that are out now is uh, the beauty of my, uh, the beauty of a diamond through the eyes of a coach. And then the beauty of a diamond through the eyes of a coach, new edition. So the first edition, you can only get used at this point. Um, the second edition with 10 new chapters, you can get um, on my website or through Amazon. 
Uh, and then the third one is The Journey of My Mother's Son, Volume 1. And then uh, the two I'm working on right now are The Journey of My Mother's Son, Volume 2. Uh, volume 1 is, is Many Random Thoughts from the Road. So it's just a lot of exactly what it says, just random thoughts um, of our first 18 months of traveling and the first months leading up to us traveling. Um, just kind of what I was processing, what we we're going through, and then things we've seen. Um, volume two is Many Little People, um, which will really talk about, uh, you know, just short stories of the people we've met on this journey and how, how amazing they are. And then the, uh, the other one I'm working on right now is actually a children's book, um, which is being written through the, the eyes and perspective of our golden retriever. So it's uh, four paws and six wheels across America. Um, uh, the adventures of Eucalyptus, the golden retriever. So part of my blogging is actually doing a blog as if he's writing it from his perspective. Um, and my sister-in-law had suggested that um, I should do a children's book as well. So that book is actually complete right now, but in the illustrations process. Um, so hoping that that'll be out within the next month or two. Um, and that that's a lot of fun because it's a, it's a different style of writing for me. Um, you know, it, it's like, it's like true fiction, so to speak, you know, it, it's really taking things that, you know, he and I have done or experienced, um, but kind of turning him into, if he had a voice, uh, how he would be looking at it and processing it, um, as opposed to, you know, most of my other writing is truly from a first person, you know, memoir style. Um, so it's fun to, to, uh, to write, um, you know, through his eyes for sure. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to the children's book coming out. Um, you know, as far as the, the Journey of My Mother's Son series, there'll be um, four, four, four books in that series. Volume three will be Many Little Places, um, which will again, just talk about all the incredible places that we've, we've been able to see so far. They're not all of them, but a highlight of, you know, ones worth talking about. They're all worth talking about, but um, if I spoke about them all, the book would never end. So, so I got to cherry pick um, the, the ones that stick out. And then the, uh, the fourth volume of that book will be uh, more of like a kind of a coffee table picture book, which will just be, it'll be called Many Little Pictures. And it's, uh, you know, it'll just be a lot of the photos that we've taken on our journey with some, you know, a little bit of narrative around it, but mostly, um, you know, mostly just pictures and being able to share um, you know, some of the beauty that we've been able to see, which again, we'll, we won't be able to do it justice because a photo isn't nearly like seeing it with your own two eyes, but um, it, it will, uh, it'll definitely serve its purpose and hopefully getting some people to uh, go out and see the world a little bit. But if, if not in an RV, just hop in the car and take a weekend trip somewhere sometime. Excellent, excellent. And just uh, finally, there with the with the podcast, uh, like, is it always with guests, or did you do you do some solo talks based on your travels? I've done one monologue so far, um, and I did that right around Christmas and New Year's of last year. And uh, I know my my old producer, um, you know, she had told me I should do more monologues. Um, I'm just not there yet, like. Uh, I really enjoy the interaction and, and speaking with a guest um, and, you know, just, you know, speaking into a microphone for me right now is just a little awkward yet. Um, Cause even, you know, it, it's different than if you're speaking on a stage and speaking to people, cause again, you, you get that interaction and you're feeding it where, you know, if you're just kind of sitting there speaking into a microphone, at least for me right now, um, it's just a little awkward. And, and I'm not there yet. So the fact that I've done one so far is actually a, a big break <laughs> in, it, in its own right. So as soon as I'd produced that, when I, I sent my old producer a, a link, I said, well, I finally took your advice. And she, she was like, you know, yay, hopefully there's more to come. But that's been, you know, seven months now. So we'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll I, I, see. I normally do them for the first episode of each podcast. And I don't like them either. It's I I, I just kind of it's like Billy No Mates, you know. You're it just feels strange, you know. You can I mean I wouldn't be reading it, but it I prefer the interaction as well. It's a lot better. And just uh, curious on your books, did you do the audio and did you do it yourself? 
I have not done audio books um, for them, but it is definitely something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and I, I think someday maybe I maybe I will. And if and if I do, I would actually want to do it myself. Like I, like I really would. I just think if again, because my spot, my style of writing, you know, it's it's me writing. So I think the the proper narrative would be you know through my voices as well. So uh, it's definitely something I've I've thought about because I know audiobooks are really becoming all the rage. Um, so it, it's definitely it's definitely in their turning that that uh, I may need to, you know, sit down and, and get to a studio and do that. Yeah, no, I definitely think you should because uh, you know you get a, a lot more, uh, you know, listeners off. Not only the the book, but then they'll follow up with the podcast as well because they like your style and everything. So, no, listen, then thoroughly enjoyed our conversations. You might let people know how can they get in contact with you. Yeah, uh, just go to my website. The address is journeyofmymotherson.com. Or you can just go to danclauser.com. They both go to the exact same site. Uh, everything you need to know about me is there. Um, my blogs are there. Um, there's a page as far as um, you know, booking me for speaking engagements. Uh, you can get copies of my book on there, um, both through Amazon, or you can get signed copies directly through the website. Um, so yeah, everything you need to know. Uh, there, I've got a media page there, which has all the um, podcast that I've been a guest on, um, posted there on my media page. If you want to learn, you know, see other interviews of me outside of, of just this one, um, they're all on there. So that's, uh, that's really your, your one-stop shop to, to find everything Dan Clouser and, uh, our journey for sure. No, excellent. Perfect. And I'll make sure I put all the links on both the audio and the video. Thank you very much, Dan. Enjoyed the conversation. So that's all for the speaking podcast uh, be sure to give us a thumbs up five star rating subscribe and also subscribe to dan's podcast because it all helps the more people that give them a thumbs up and subscribe it helps and you'll find all about my uh, podcasting coaching on bio.link forward slash podcast until next week take care